It's good to see you on this second Sunday of Easter, which is also known as Low Sunday. (laughs) So from a priest and a choir music perspective, it's good to have somebody here. So thank you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, Ever and ever. Amen. What I just read is the collect for the Sunday closest to November 16th. But I thought it appropriate to start with that this morning, given the text that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. And because that collect always reminds me of the prophet Ezekiel who literally ate the scripture to take its meaning deep within itself. Now, the sermon this morning is a little bit different in form or in style than my usual, so bear with me. Our gospel this morning is a story of doubting Thomas, one who needed to see the hands the feet, and the side of Jesus before he would believe in the risen Lord. The concept of death and resurrection was too much for him, so he wanted physical proof that the resurrection was real. Now, part of the Bible that we have today, which of course did not exist at the time of Jesus, But parts of the Bible we have today are hard enough for us to believe because we can see contradictory passages, contradictory images of God. We read about miracles and other events that seem too far-fetched to be credible. So sometimes we are like doubting Thomas questioning what we read or what we hear. And I think the attitude of the Episcopal Church of not leaving your brain at the door is one reason that I and some others have chosen this faith tradition. Now, when we face one of those, I don't get it, it can be important to remember that Jesus was Jewish and to remember the culture and the faith tradition within which he lived, because we regularly read of Jesus being at the synagogue or the temple, and of Jesus reading from the scriptures and interpreting them to those present. Now, there are a lot of times I wish Jesus was still here, and I could say, okay, I don't get it. What did you mean when you said? We don't have that opportunity. Now, in Jesus' time and still today, the Jewish people have divided their holy scriptures into three basic categories. The Torah, or the first five books, what might be analogous to our Gospels. The Torah is the core And a portion from the Torah is read at each service, just like we read a portion from a gospel when we are going to have communion or if you pray the daily offices. In in the Jewish tradition, there's a Torah, and then the other books in the Hebrew Bible are categorized as writings or prophets. Now, the writings contain a variety of different types of scripture, and they include apocalyptic passages and books such as Daniel. Daniel and the lion's den, anybody? 
in wisdom books such as Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. There is a time for everything under the sun. Now, we do much the same, although the titles of our groups are Gospels, Letters, and Epistles. Many people are frightened or intimidated by the book of Revelation, our own apocalyptic scripture. But it's in our canon that is the agreed upon grouping of scripture. So we can't ignore it because it's too weird. We don't like the imagery or we don't want to think about what John or others may have meant when it was written. Now, in our tradition on Sundays, we generally read from the Old Testament, the New Testament, a gospel, and a psalm. Except in Easter season, of course, when we throw in the Acts of the Apostles. But be that as it may, we are immersed in Scripture. And Scripture is not always easy to understand. It can be a real struggle to figure out what God is calling us to do in response to these sacred texts. A prime example is the revelation to John. Note that it is not revelations, plural, or the revelation of John. It's actually the revelation to John. I know, lawyer being wordsmith. The other thing is that whoever put our lectionary together makes some unusual choices, in my opinion, from time to time, and this reading the more, this morning is one. Because they failed to give us context, they failed to give us those introductory verses, and here they are. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I think that opening is important to our understanding of the entire book. First, Jesus is the revelation, the unveiling of what God wants us to know. Second, John received this revelation from an angel and is testifying, that is, telling the truth of Jesus Christ. Third, that those of us who hear these words read and who keep what we hear are blessed. And fourth, what we have in Revelation is prophecy to assist us with the times to come. Now, Revelation has often been reviled because it is just plain weird to our contemporary ears. The end times have not come, so it can seem anachronistic and irrelevant. And someone has said, quote, a study of revelation either finds a man mad or leaves him mad, close quote. But I hope today you are neither mad to start nor at the end. Rather, I hope you might ponder what we can learn from and about the revelation to John that is relevant to our life and our faith today. Now, sometimes trying to decode revelation takes away from its beauty and its importance. That is, we need to learn to live with ambiguity 
and perhaps to rekindle our imagination. Some have said that those of us that like science fiction are often the ones who like revelation. And perhaps it is more that when we can get out of our usual mindset of facts and figures and move into a way of hearing and responding to scripture that includes more than facts and figures, we can see and learn from Revelation. Now John, the writer, uses signs and symbols and references to the Old Testament in nearly every verse. One definition of a symbol is something that points to something else. For example, a stop sign is just that, a sign that says stop. It can also be a reminder that stopping at that particular point is helpful if you want to stay safe. A stop sign is a caution. Similarly, the bread and wine that we eat and drink at communion is in fact bread and wine. It's ordinary food. that, But when eaten, drunk as part of communion, the bread and the wine are symbols for the body and blood of Jesus, shed for us and for our salvation. They are bread and wine, yet so much more. For some of us, the bread and wine are actually transformed into the real presence of Jesus the Christ. He was, in fact, born, lived, and died for us, who was resurrected and who waits for us at the end of our earthly lives. Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters believe that when the bread and wine are consecrated, they become the very physical body of Jesus the Christ. We Episcopalians call whatever it is that happens to that bread and wine when it is consecrated and we take it in, the real presence of Jesus. John calls what he is writing a prophecy. And it's good to remember that prophecy is not telling the future. It's not what a carnival fortune teller will tell you about your future. Rather, a prophet speaks God's words. A prophet calls the people back to God. And there are consequences when we fail to heed the warnings. The greeting in our passage this morning, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, was a typical greeting of that day. The grace is from God, not earned, but given freely and without hindrance. That grace is what entitles us and enables us to live in peace. The him, of course, is Jesus. And the who is and who was and who is to come reminds us that God is still active in our world, even today. And we see echoes of this in our Eucharistic liturgy when we say together, Christ has died. Christ has risen, Christ will come again. This is an important reminder to us that God has not forgotten us, despite how it may seem when life is constantly in turmoil, and there are so many unknowns and so many tragedies. God is ever-present. I love radiators. <laughs> Our passage today closes with, I am the Alpha and the Omega. 
reminding us once again that there is nothing and nowhere that God is absent. From beginning to the very end, God is with us. And this reminds us of Paul's letter to the Romans that we so often use at funerals. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. I think that's fundamentally the message of Revelation. God is and has been and always will be. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. And it's also a good reminder that at least now and then, we need to get out of our heads, out of and away from taking everything as a fact or a figure that can be proved. We need at times to return to our imagination. So do not be dismayed that the revelation to John is challenging because struggling with the word of God is part of what we are called to do to deepen our faith and to live a life based on God. I commend to you one of the scriptures chosen from Paul's letter to the Ephesians which we read regularly at the close of evening prayer. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Yeah.